Hello, everyone. Welcome. Pop myself up here so you can see me a little bit better. Uh, this is Armando Rojo, your host for Commerce Co. And you are watching the very first live presentation for the Commerce Co. community. You are among the explorers, the, uh, the founders, the beginners who are uh, helping us start something great. You're laying the foundation for a community of commerce professionals who can come together, seek out information, share information, and grow. And we have, uh, I think, what's going to be an amazing presentation today. We have uh, Raj Dadan, who is the CEO of Bloomreach. Now, if you've read me on Practic Commerce, you know that I've written about their company before. had a great experience talking to Brian Walker over there, and uh, they were kind enough to present to us. So I'm going to focus here on Raj. And uh, Raj, do you want to say hello for a second? Hey, Armando. It's a pleasure to be with you, and it's a pleasure to be with, uh, with the community. Excited about this uh, hour we have together. Awesome. Well, everyone, I'm going to just uh, turn things over here to Raj, just so that you know, I'm going to show you his screen. Uh, what we're going to have happen is he's going to start off, introduce himself, uh, give us a presentation. Uh, at the end of that presentation, I'm going to get to ask him some questions, and you're going to get to ask him some questions. So please go ahead and post those questions in the chat. Um, there's actually should be an ask a question button that you can use, and that's a great button to use because then later on, when we share this presentation uh, for other members to watch, they'll actually be able to jump directly to your question, or you could even jump to it if you wanted to share it uh, with colleagues. So, Raj, uh, thank you very much again for being here. Do you want to take over and uh, present to us? Happy to do that, Armando. Uh, once again, pleasure to be with you all. Excited to talk about this topic, which is just a look at e-commerce and what a time to be having this conversation uh, coming off maybe the most important year uh, for e-commerce since call it the launch of Amazon and the, and the birth of the Netscape browser, you know, 25 years ago. So, uh, you know, with 2020 behind us, tumultuous year all around, but the pandemic really, you know, told us that e-commerce and commerce are really the same thing. The digital and life are really the same thing. We saw that in all the data, we saw an incredible, a uh, set of growth, almost five years of e-commerce adoption compressed in one year in Bloomreach's uh, data. And, uh, and so that really set me on course to do a bunch of research about the future of e-commerce. Uh, and in particular, where e-commerce is going, where it's going in 2021, and then maybe where it's going more long term. Um, and then it also led me to this undertaking of the research for a book that uh, that I'm, I'm going to be publishing here starting in March of uh, 2021 with full rollout in June. And the book is called The Digital Seeker, and it's a guide for, for digital teams to build winning experiences. And, and uh, as I think about this book, um, I, I think it's really timely. I wrote it, you know, fundamentally because I believe we're entering a new era of e-commerce and digital. I'm excited to share the findings with you. It's the result of, of a ton of research. And of course, if you're interested in, in the book as it comes out, I encourage you to consult this link um, or just go to Amazon, search for The Digital Seeker, and you will see uh, the book and it's on pre-order. I uh, encourage you to pre-order it and, and uh, we're excited to get you the copy of it. So, you know, a little bit just on myself before I, I launch in here, I am a uh, multiple time entrepreneur. Uh, I have the curse, the Silicon Valley curse of having to keep starting companies and being fundamentally unemployable uh, and therefore have no choice except to start the next company. So this, this business, Bloomreach, is my third uh, company that I started out here in the Valley now over 10 years ago. And, and we really started Bloomreach with a thesis of applying the best of AI and machine learning to transform e-commerce experiences. And I'll tell you more about the business and the offering as time goes on. But I've been, I've been studying this space and in particular the use of technology around e-commerce for, for now uh, 10 plus years as part of this venture uh, and as part of my previous previous ventures as well. Um, so here we are. So let's talk about uh, kind of where we are in, in as, we, as we set upon 2021 and what we can expect from what will be, I think, an incredible year for e-commerce to sustain the growth and sustain the transformation we've seen in the commerce industry. I tried to boil it down as we as we start off 2021 with with my five uh, top predictions and and I tried to pick the ones that I think are are maybe not always the most intuitive uh, of those uh, 
of those predictions that are out there. Like the best predictions, I think if you get them, get them all right, you're probably not aggressive enough. Uh, and so, so excited to share uh, my predictions with you. So let's start with number one, which is the post pandemic, you know, brick and mortar retail will start to come back, uh, but in a new way that is digital first. So let's talk a little bit about that. You know, we, we, we as an industry around e-commerce have, have discussed multi-channel and omni-channel now for the last five plus years. And it's been really this idea that we don't really care how our customers shop how they work with us, how they come to us. We just care about delivering them a great experience and getting them to interact with our offering, our products, and ultimately sell them, sell them our products. And while that's been a stated goal, it's been the furthest thing from reality. I think every major brick and mortar uh, retailer that I've worked with still runs a, an e-commerce P&L, pretty separate from their, um, their offline brick and mortar P&L still runs channels in a very independent way. They have an email channel and an advertising channel and a print channel and the catalog and all the other things that, that go along with marketing. So this idea of omni-channel has been theoretically what people have been trying to get to, but largely, I would say, um, occurring in very small ways. But I, I think what, we're, what we've seen through the pandemic is the stop and start of retail stores kind of opening, closing, opening for 25%, curbside pickup, all of the ways by which uh, people were interested in shopping, but shopping uh, in a way that, that involved digital. So that might be, I place an order and I show up at the curb and somebody delivers it to me. It might be that um, I might go into the store and check it out, but I'll really kind of fulfill online uh, because all the fulfillment was really tied to the online channel. It might be that uh, I engage uh, offline in conversations, but then I really shop online. And so the con change in consumer behavior, we think has been really profound in 2020. In fact, the 100% growth in e-commerce that we saw where e-commerce as a percentage of retail almost doubled from 15% to about 30% um, in total in 2020, a lot of that was driven by people who would shop online, shopping more online, and people who were never shopping online, starting to shop online, in, in particular in categories like, like grocery where penetration was, was incredibly low. So what does this all mean? What this all means is brick and mortar will come back. Let's not, let's not mistake ourselves. People don't simply want to sit in front of their computer or their phone and transact. They will want the entertainment value. They will want the social value. They will want to talk to somebody. And so we think that, that stores will open. Uh, certainly there'll be fewer of them. They'll be more consultative, but they will be digital first. And, and what I mean by that is that the level of knowledge of a shopper who walks into a, a brick and mortar store, uh, they'll really see the brick and mortar store as a part of the shopping journey. They'll have done their research online. They'll have certainly comparison shopped online. They'll have perhaps consulted the app. They'll show up in the store. They might undertake more research. They may or may not buy there. They will then go back home and continue the, the purchasing process. So it'll really just be a step uh, where instead of us thinking about, hey, brick and mortar is the main act, digital is this thing on the side, some people do A, some people do B, it'll be really mostly digital and the brick and mortar part will be a piece of the journey in a shopping funnel. And that's what I mean by saying that, it, that it's really gonna be um, digital first. So, this, the second prediction here is, is really counterintuitive because with we've all seen the shutdowns and, and malls closing and all of that. But our prediction here is that actually there'll be many more retailers or commerce businesses than there were before the pandemic, not fewer. And that's kind of interesting. Where does that come from? Well, historically, retail has basically been about selling other people's products. And so we're seeing, obviously, the people that have had a business model of selling other people's products, either without a marketplace or without brands of their own, has started to struggle with real estate footprints when they're when you can actually just buy the same product on Amazon or buy the product online or buy the product from a competitor. But equally, as a class of retail has struggled, we're seeing just an incredible growth of direct to customer brands. And we see that in the Shopify stores. We see that in the big commerce stores. Those are partners of Bloomreach. And so, you know, all of those millions of entrepreneurs who are putting up storefronts online are now in the e-commerce business. And so if you just think about the fact that, you know, you used to 
you, you know, you used to buy your sports brand from Sports Authority and now you buy the sports brand directly from, or, or you used to buy the sports equipment from Sports Authority, now you buy your sports equipment directly from Peloton. And then you've got another hundred sports brands that are selling directly to you. The number of people trying to sell products to you, on, uh, in particular online, is really just exploding. And so we're actually at a time when what's in the news is very much about stores shutting down. What's, what's the reality is that stores are actually, many more stores are opening up and they're just opening up in a digital first mindset. And so we're, we're actually in a, in a time of explosion of retail rather than a time of, of paring down retail, uh, despite what we know of some of, of, of the biggest retailers that are out there. You know, that takes us to number three. So if brick and mortar is gonna reopen and if commerce is gonna explode, well then what are these physical retail stores gonna look like? And they're gonna be all expected to deliver an Apple genius bar type of experience. And, and, and so if we rethink the retail store, the retail store just can't be about the place I go to buy something. It has to be the place I go for deep expertise. It has to be the place I go for deep entertainment. It's got to be the kind of experience that I simply can't get on my mobile device or at home. And so what does that experience really look like? Well, it looks like the kind of experience where the person behind the counter knows so much that it's actually worth my time to go talk to that person rather than do my research online because it's just too painful to find the answer online. Um, and as much as Apple has been super successful online and the Apple Store online does it incredibly well, people still go to the Genius Bar because I got tons of questions where it's just much more efficient for me to talk to somebody who's knowledgeable. And I also want the entertainment. I want the place where I can take my kids to play video games on the side while I'm talking to the genius bar person. So it's got to be an entertaining, worthwhile experience. And that's what we're looking at in terms of the future of physical retail. What's interesting about that is, you know, we've seen, uh, of course, unfortunately, a lot of people lose their jobs and some, some that are not going to come back in terms of retail store associates. But actually what I think is gonna happen is that the best retail store associates are gonna be even more valuable. Because just like the Apple Genius Bar person, you gotta have true retail expertise in order to hold down the fort and deliver this kind of experience to the customer. And those kinds of people are gonna be rewarded with more pay and more demand. And that's gonna create higher paying, better wage jobs for a more premium experience in, in the retail stores that are out there. You know, what is this all going to mean? Well, we're going to stop thinking about commerce as a section of the economy and start thinking about it as the economy. So, you know, if you think about my 20 year sort of entrepreneurial journey with commerce, I feel like we used to think of, uh, of commerce as really the big department stores. We used to think of it as the big retailers. Then we started to think about it as the big retailers and the specialty retailers, the people who just sold eyeglasses or just sold sports equipment, not just the the, the Macy's and the JC Penney's and the, and the targets of the world. Then we started to say, it's not just about specialty retails, it's about the big brands. Now, Adidas opens a store or Puma opens a store or Apple opens a store, so we get to premium brands. And then we say, well, actually, it's not just about premium brands, it's also about B2B commerce. So let's include the B2B distributors, the people that sell HVAC equipment, the people that sell restaurant supplies, they're now part of commerce. And then we said, well, let's include in that these direct to customer brands, these Shopify stores, the millions of them, they're part of the commerce economy. And then we said, well, actually, let's include the B2B brands, you know, a, a brand like Bosch that makes uh, all kinds of, of equipment that they sell to B2B that's a bloomer each customer. They're selling online. So they're a member of the commerce community. Then we get into telecom commerce and financial services as commerce. So then we ask ourselves, instead of thinking about retail and e-commerce as a section of the economy, we start thinking about it as the economy. Everybody at some level is selling something, selling a service, selling a product, selling an offering, selling ad units, selling eyeball space. And so everything is a product that is a form of commerce that is delivered in a targeted fashion to an individual. And that's, that's kind of how we think about, about uh, the direction of the economic landscape around uh, around commerce. So, you know, I, I wanna end, um, you know, my prediction for, for 2021, which is that it's gonna be, the, the growth in B2B is actually gonna even outpace the growth in B2C. Um, 
B2B commerce as a percentage of total transactional volume has historically been 7% when B2C was 15%. And we're going to see B2B try to leapfrog B2C in a, in a significant way. And probably not all the way there in 2021, but the growth rate in B2B commerce is going to explode in 2021. And we see that from our interactions because business, the, the same people that shop online at home go, go to work and want to buy products, want to buy all of the different things they're doing online and not talk to a sales rep in order to transact for, on behalf of their business. And B2B companies are really waking up to this. The demographic shift towards online is, is waking them up to this. The operational savings they're going to get. Many B2B companies, especially industrial manufacturers, have seen the supply chain challenges of 2020 with the pandemic and have, have started to address that. And I, I can't tell you how significantly digital has moved to the top of their agenda. So these are my five uh, 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 predictions. And that leads me you know, really into the book. And the book um, has been a bit of a labor of love and it's been a lot of fun to write. I think what's what I wanted to write the book is I felt like there've been a bunch of books around digital transformation and what it takes organizationally. But I didn't feel like there was the answer of what makes the winners the winners. And we see a lot of losers in digital and we see a lot of winners. And we're fortunate at Bloomreach that we get to work with several hundred of the best brands on the planet. So we get to see the winners from the losers from our vantage point. I get to see that through my seed and venture investing as well for the, from the early stage startup community in Silicon Valley and who they serve and, and really assess what drives the winners and the losers. So I wanted to distill what makes the winners the winners. Um, and, and this is a product of, of, of dozens and dozens of interviews with some of the practitioners in the space, executives. Uh, and, and the book, as I envisioned it, is not a technical book. It is a, it is a business book, but it's a book for the digital team. And team is important here uh, because digital is no longer a person's job. Digital is a team sport. And while there have been books that perhaps have been written for the developer, perhaps have been written for digital marketing, perhaps have been written for merchandising, or maybe have been written for C-level executives in the board. There has not, never been a book for the whole team that lays out how the team works together to win. And so the digital seeker is, uh, is our distillation of what it takes to win and win big. So a couple of key takeaways from the research. Um, we've spent the last, we've spent the last, I would say 10 or 15 years when we've been talking about digital, the next word that often comes up is customer because there's been lots of research about, well, why does a customer buy? And how do we serve our customer? And how do we improve our customer satisfaction? And what does the customer experience feel like? And how do we get the customer to transact? But interestingly, I believe that the digital experience platform of the future to win big in digital, you build your experience for the seeker, not the customer. Now. What does that mean? Well, what it really means is that great digital experiences are actually not built for what the customer is asking you for. They're built for the intention behind why they're asking you for that thing. So let's, let's, let's talk about an example. If I were to go out and decide, I wanna go build a deck in my house. By the time I show up to homedepot.com or lowes.com, I might be looking for a piece of plywood or I might be looking for a set of tools. And so I go on, I shop online, I search or I browse or I click on Google or I go to Amazon and I'm looking for my tool set or I'm looking for my, um, my piece of plywood. And so the retailer only knows that I'm looking for plywood. So they might deliver plywood, but, but the truth is I can get that plywood from lots of places. So why should I buy that plywood from that particular store? Lots of people carry plywood, right? But the best experiences aren't going to build their digital experiences for selling plywood. They're going to build their digital experiences to give you everything it takes to build a deck. Because that way, I don't have to go through the trouble of finding the plywood from one place, the tool set from some other place, do the research on what it takes to go install it, figure out the environmental issues or the clearances in my local uh, vicinity to go build the, the, the deck in some fashion. The trouble is the, the emergence of digital has kind of shifted the work from digital retailers to the consumer. 
Because by the time I show up, I used to be able to call my contractor and say, hey, can you make this happen for me? I'm just trying to build a great deck. But then with the democratization of e-commerce, it became, hey, you, Armando, you're trying to build a deck. You do all the work. You figure out all the pieces. You figure out how to do it. You figure out how to source it. Source it. We'll just be a transactional vehicle to sell you the parts to go build the deck. Well, what just happened there? It, it might be cheaper to go make that happen. But all of a sudden, my to-do list as a consumer of all my digital sort of to-dos has just exploded because I got to figure all this stuff out. And by the time I show up, I've got to um, know the answer to the question of all the pieces that I need to go build that deck, which just transfers a lot of work and a lot of heartburn and isn't necessarily a better customer experience. So the seeker is the person behind the customer. The seeker seeks something. They might seek a great deck. They might want a great vacation. They might want uh, a date. They're not looking for the dress or uh, the particular reservation on an airline ticket or the piece of plywood. That's the thing that the seeker having uh, described the intention turns that into a set of buying motions for which there are customers from multiple places. And so if you serve the seeker, you really win and delight the customer in a way that other people can't. And that's not, um, that's not uh, something that, that is purely theoretical. All the winners do this. Let's think about people like uh, someone like an Uber, right? Uber didn't decide, hey, let's build a faster taxi. They said, the customer is looking for a taxi. The seeker is looking to get from point A to point B. So I'm just going to build a service to get people from point A to point B. with built-in payments and built-in mapping and built-in cars showing up and waiting time and check out and all of that happening. By building it for the seeker, it makes it impossible for a competitor who's a taxi company to very easily compete with them. And that is what all the great digital experience providers do in their respective vertical. We can talk about retail examples that do that. We can talk about uh, healthcare examples that do that. Uh, really in every form of commerce, the great experiences are built for the seeker, not the customer. So the second uh, takeaway from the research is that you can't just go out and buy a winning digital experience. You got to build it. And why is that? Well, it's because fundamentally your digital experience is your source of competitive advantage. We often think of, hey, we're in the business of selling clothing. That's our business. The website is just the thing that helps me sell the clothing. Wrong. The website is the product. The app is the product. So whatever the reason is people are going to buy your clothing, you got to make sure you put that competitive advantage online. Now, if I'm starting a digital transformation or a digital team or a digital endeavor, and I just say, hey, I'm going to hire a digital person. They're going to source all the people. They're going to source all the technology. They're going to source all the content. They're going to source all the products and package it up, put it online, go. Well, by definition, all of my competitors can do exactly the same thing. I have no, I've done nothing to put my competitive advantage online. And so if you accept the fact that your digital presence has to speak to your competitive advantage to give you a reason to shop with you rather than someone else, well then by definition, you gotta build it. You gotta know, that doesn't mean you gotta build every part. That doesn't mean you gotta source every piece of technology, but you gotta know, you know what? I'm in the, I might be selling eyeglasses, but the actual experience by which you fit the eyeglasses, that's what's unique to me digitally. So I'm gonna own that part and really make sure digitally that I can build that in a way that speaks to my brand and my competitive advantage. The rest sounds good. We can do that in all kinds of different ways, but there is not much point to building a digital exp uh, experience that is gonna win if you don't know what makes you special and have the ability to build that special thing online and surround it. Now to do that, you really need a digital experience platform because most companies doing this are really not technology companies. And so there is a uh, technology set and we at Bloomreach are one of those that supply something called a digital experience platform. And it just makes it really easy. It has everything you need to assemble that digital experience. You want you know, an AI powered search box or you want content to put your content up or you wanna structure your product catalog or you wanna publish that or you want uh, a way for people to discover your website from Google. You can 
assemble the tools and still customize it in a way that enables you to put your competitive advantage online. But if all you're doing is signing up with Shopify and calling it a day, there's only so far you're going to get in terms of a good reason for, for somebody to uh, shop with you. In fact, you know, one of the one of the e-commerce platforms, Demandware, which is used by lots of, of brands online, I often tell people I can go to any Demandware store and frankly, I can't tell the difference between them. They look identical to each other and they pretty much don't give me a great reason why I should go shop there versus go shop at Amazon because they don't look and feel different. The experience isn't any different. There's nothing different about it. So it's really important to internalize the competitive advantage point and build it on a platform. Um, in a way that that, that accelerates uh, the ability to win. And all the winners do this. The final piece of, of the takeaway is that winning digital experiences are built by product-centric teams. So this is interesting, right? So it goes back to our conversation about the fact that if I, if I sell home goods, I often think of my product as the sofa or the, um, the dining table. And I think of the website as market wrong. The digital experience itself is part of the product, right? It's just as important as the finish on the table or just as important as the upholstery on the, on the sofa. And so if I, if, I, if I believe that that's the case, then I actually need to have a digital product mindset, which is very much a Silicon Valley mindset to the way I do digital. If you go to any software company or e-commerce company, you know, built out of uh, uh, from scratch in the last five, seven years, they will have a product team. There will be a product manager. There will be a digital merchandiser. There will be a designer. There will be a digital marketer. There will be a leader of that group who is often a VP of e-commerce or a, or a chief digital officer. There will be uh, security people. There will be developers as a part of it. They will be a team. And that team treats the digital experience like a product, which means they do market research about what product makes sense. They do all the, the planning and strat strategic assessments. They do the building together. They do the marketing together. They release it together and they keep iterating on that experience all the time. They don't ship the products, throw it over to marketing and say, hey, marketing, go figure out a, a way to go sell this online. They treat it as a product offering that they're, that they're evolving through, uh, through a journey that's always getting better. And that's what you're going to find at Airbnb. And that's what you're going to find at Wayfair. And that's what you're going to find at Amazon. And so a, a, a business trying to go digital that does not have a product centric team that has a mindset of winning with the product is never going to win in the end. Lots more to talk about on these topics, but um, the research really says perhaps the most optimistic thing about uh, that I learned from, from the research here is this is not the province of the Amazons and the Ubers. You know, we've seen folks like Uncommon Goods that we work with that have built chatbots for gift giving that have helped stand out their business. We've seen soccer teams like Bayern Munich that run uh, the German, that was one of the lead, leading German soccer teams, build an e-commerce franchise online without a technology foundation. Um, you know, we've seen organizations like ones that, that I'm involved with, the U.S. Tennis Association, build AI and analytics and all kinds of capabilities to help evolve the digital experience for tennis. So this is not the story of, um, of Silicon Valley companies and, and them being the winners. This is, this is the story of people who understand what it takes to win and apply it in all kinds of different industries to win in, in, a, in an incredibly big way. You know, um, I want to end uh, this part of, of the dialogue with with one of our Bloomreach customers and one that I love because it's a hundred year old company. It's a company called Cedar Fair, and and they're they're an amusement park company. And so, you know, if you go to they have uh, Cedar Point and a number of, of these across the country in the U.S. You know, originally started in in Ohio, and uh, you know, great great uh, amusement park. And so, five or ten years ago. You know, they said, oh, this digital thing, it's interesting. You know, we got to do something. So they had an online website. They just described what the amusement park had available online. I call it the brochureware era of the web, where you literally take your brochure and you put it online. And it says all the attractions and it says a pricing and it says the hours when you go online. And what we've seen is that 
that's cool. People would look at that online. They'd show up to the amusement park. But then that doesn't change anything about the actual amusement park experience. That just enables people to know what's happening at the amusement park when they check the brochure. But, you know, Cedar Fair realized they needed a different kind of digital experience. They needed to infuse the, the actual amusement park with digital. So now you go to their experience and you can be standing online. You can know the times uh, each of the rides are open. You can know the wait times. You can order online on an app. You can know which rides are crowded and which rides are not. You can understand the safety issues. You can you can input perhaps you know your children's uh, ages and you're not having to to scrounge around and figure out what they can ride. Effectively, the question is: Is there an amusement park and then a digital experience? No, the digital experience and the amusement park are really the same thing. And now they're not building a digital experience just for the customer who showed up at the amusement park and, and placing it in the customer's hands to figure the rest out. They know that what the customer is really seeking is an incredible day out for the kids. And so let's just make that happen digitally. And then we'll win them over forever. So I'll end here with just a little bit about who Bloomreach is. Um, happy for us to talk to, to any of you about that. But, um, you know, I started Bloomreach 10 plus years ago, uh, and um, it's been uh, it's been awesome. It was started really with this intuition that the best AI and machine learning technology had been the province of, of Google and Amazon and, and Facebook. Why not apply that to every website, every e-commerce journey in the world? And instead of manually constructing every page on an e-commerce experience, let's use AI and machine learning to make every interaction that a consumer has amazing. And then let's ensure that in doing so, it drives business for the brands because they're delivering on point experiences, you know, win you over as a customer and drive more revenue for their businesses. And so that's been the journey of Bloomreach uh, over the last kind of 10 years. And, you know, I'm pleased that today we power brands representing about 25% of e-commerce in, in the U S and the UK across some of the best brands in B2C commerce and B2B commerce who run much of, if you're shopping at, Many of these properties, um, you know, buying fashion at Torrid, buying groceries at Safeway, buying office supplies at Staples, or if you're you're buying uh, electrical components at RS or air conditioners at at Carrier or um, or uh, HVAC equipment at at uh, at HD Supply, you're going to be interacting with a web page and experience where Bloomreach AI has figured out this is exactly the right product or piece of content to put in front of you in a way that increases the probability that you get what you're looking for and they win you over as a customer. And so we do that really in, in five different ways. Um, we've got five core applications for the business. We'll power your search box. So if you're searching on uh, any of these websites, if you, if, you, if you go search around, that search box is powered by Bloomreach to help you find the right product. If you're browsing, then our merchandising technology is helping you navigate that website. If you're interacting with content elements, maybe manuals, in a B2B context, or maybe creative or videos in the context of a B2C retailer, the con our content system is powering that. If you're interacting with recommendations that say, hey, we think this is the perfect um, you know, dresser for your living room, given that you bought you know, this particular bed set, those recommendations are powered by us. And same thing with the landing pages to help, help these brands acquire you from a Google or a Bing if you're searching there from an SEO perspective. So these five core services are all delivered by API. And by the time you as a consumer show up on a website or tablet or are interacting via chat box or in store through an associate, you're really interacting with our backend technology that's, that's delivering a great experience to you as a consumer and taking care of ensuring that it's the right product and the right experience for you given what you're seeking. So I'm gonna, I'm, uh, I'm gonna stop there, Armando, I think. Um, I think we've covered the topics uh, that we had in mind. Awesome, that was great. Thank you very much. Let me uh, get us back up here. I'm actually gonna, I'm gonna actually go ahead and close uh, your presentation if that's okay, Raj. Sure. Okay, so just the two of us back here. So for the audience, please go ahead and start to ask your questions. I've got a few questions I'm gonna ask of Raj first, and then uh, I will address yours. The, the very first one that I'm going to ask you about, and maybe you covered this in your research, maybe you didn't, and I'll, uh, I'll let you even answer that way if you didn't, but you talked about what the 
the winners do. And part of that was having this product team and, and really creating a digital experience that focuses or, or that is their competitive advantage. But it seems to me like it can be sometimes difficult to identify what your competitive advantage is. Like, how do I know that I need to focus on, you know, the length of a queue at Cedar Point uh, versus something else? Yeah. So can you talk a little bit to how the winners kind of identify where yeah. they can get a competitive advantage? Yeah, I think I think it's a great question, Armando. And and a lot of this is the old school things that you do in business. Meaning, do you understand your customers? Have you done surveys? Do you know what what where your brand speaks to people and where it doesn't? Do you know who it speaks to? Do you understand your target customer audience really clearly to know who you're built for and who you're not built for? So many of those things I would say are are old school you know, business research things that would apply digitally, non-digitally and everywhere else. And that, and that those are the pieces that, that come along with that. But I will say there are some new capabilities that digital enables to help you identify your competitive advantage, to augment your understanding from, from, the, from, from other sources. And the most important one is to recognize that in the interaction of every consumer or business user with your digital experience, is a vote or a, 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 a is, is them saying something to you. And so what do I mean by that? If somebody clicks on something, they said something is interesting. If somebody looks at a page, clicks on one of the things, but doesn't click on the other things, they're actually non-voting for some things and voting for other things, right? If they come back a second time, that says something. If they come back four times, that says something more. If they interact and they bounce within five milliseconds, that says something else. So what's interesting is, is unlike historical, um, historical cases where doing this market research, maybe you need to go out and talk to lots of people and have lots of interviews and so on and so forth. You kind of can reach, especially if you're an at scale business, you can reach hundreds of thousands of people who are really giving you their point of view on your product and your offering with every interaction they're having with you digitally. The data is speaking to you. The question is, are you listening to the data? Because in, in listening to the data, it can tell you very clearly where you're excelling and where you're not. And from where you're excelling and where you're not, when compared against your competitors and augmented by the market research that you probably have from being in business for a long time, you can distill what makes you special. And that's all competitive advantage is. It's a, it's a, it's a business school way of saying what makes you special. Right. And, and I think most entrepreneurs, most leadership teams, most teams can get to the heart of what makes them special pretty clearly if they're clear and clear eyed about understanding all the signals that are being presented to them, including these new ones that are being presented digitally. That, that does make sense. And I think that would be great if I've got an established business and I can sort of iterate through those things. Yeah. But in the case of Uber, they created a space really. That's for right. me, I think they just made it simpler to pay for a taxi. That's the thing I thought of when I first saw them, right? Because yeah. because if you've ever been in that taxi experience, you're like, do I really want to hand this person my credit card? It's not always yes. Yeah. And uh, with Uber, I didn't have to. So how I, I don't think they, maybe they did, but I don't think they figured out an iterative oh, process. Right. You're right. I mean, when you're starting from scratch, I think it's a different problem. And that's why founders are founders, because right. it's really hard to envision a problem in the world and find a solution that simply doesn't exist. That's a high bar. Um, but, you know, if you if you go to sort of classic product thinking, you know, in technology, I would say often the it really isn't that different from this concept of the seeker. You know, a good product manager who was starting Uber would have asked the question, well, what's the pain? Well, the pain is, I just, it's so painful to find a taxi in New York City in the middle of, of uh, rush hour to get from point A to point B. And, th and that, under that understanding of like, this is a deep pain. It's not just a, a, a vitamin that I need. It's really, I need a painkiller for this. And then tracing the journey of that consumer to solve that problem. What are all the steps that that person undertakes in order to hail a taxi? Well, they first have to step outside. They have to make a decision that they're gonna go get somewhere. They have to make an assumption of how long it's gonna take to get from point A to point B, which may or may not be right. That's a source of stress in and of itself. Then they're right. gonna step outside. Then they're gonna look around. It's gonna be totally unpredictable whether a taxi takes a minute to arrive or 15 minutes to arrive. And that could totally throw me off, right? 
and I'm going to kind of hail around. Then I'm going to fight all my neighbors for that taxi if it's scared. Then I'm going to like track that person down. Then when I get in there, I may or may not have a good experience in the taxi to potentially get where I'm going. I won't know the route. I won't be able to tell the person without picking up the phone and calling them, hey, it looks like I'm going to be 20 minutes away or seven minutes away. I actually don't know. So I'm going to have to estimate that and, and tell somebody you know, the answer to that question. I, I won't know in real time how close I am, so I can't alert people. So if you just trace the steps, out of that comes the product. The, and payment is one of those as well. Like I swiped the credit card. I've finally gotten there. Maybe I swiped the credit card. Maybe I'm dealing with cash. And I'm, I'm, um, I'm trying to make that all work. So if you trace the steps and you say, well, look, I'm just trying to get someone from point A to point B. And I'm going to solve for what the seeker seeks, which is getting from point A to point B, and not what the customer is telling me, which is finding a taxi or paying for a taxi. All of a sudden, I create a business that has incredible competitive advantage. It makes sense. I want to kind of continue with this idea now and take that idea of creating, you know, sort of a winning uh, experience to an established retailer. So, uh, you know, think of a company that's a traditional retailer. I worked for one for almost a decade doing marketing for them. And, you know, one of the things that was really painful to me, is like we sold Carhartt. And it was to your point, I think it was your uh, point uh, number two, maybe about your predictions was going to be more brick and mortar uh, or more retailers. And, you know, we were selling Carhartt in our stores. Carhartt opened their own store a mile and a half away from one of mine, right? How as that retailer facing this environment where there's going to be more direct to consumer sales, um, talk to me about how I win against a brand selling its its own products. Yeah. Yeah. So I think there are in, in you know, for a retailer that's being disrupted, and we work with 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 Carhartt as an example, but for the retailer that's selling Carhartt and that maybe is being threatened. I think there are only really, you know, let's call it three primary ways forward. And you got to pick. That's what I would say. The mo Let's start with the model that just doesn't work. What doesn't work anymore is I'm a retailer. I've got a certain level of selection. I source all my products. I work with all my brands. I deal with the supply chain. I open a bunch of brick and mortar stores. That's my distribution. I market online and offline, get people to, I'm dependent on the number of people that walk into my store and buy the product that I bought from someone else and mark it up a bit to cover my margin and call it a day. That model of retail, which has existed for a hundred years, is gone. What, what, uh, the way forward is one of three things. So the, the first one, which is, is you really become incredibly specialized. And I would call this the it's the specialty retail model, but you got to know that you got to be so specialized that Amazon can't just eat your lunch and add a new vertical, right? So it's a high bar, but there are certain categories, particularly more complex categories of purchase where that's feasible. And that might be, you know, in certain tools categories or certain auto categories where, you know, I can build something pretty unique that you know, it turns out eyeglasses is a good example of that. I, it's pretty hard actually to be a great eyeglass retailer. There's a lot of steps to prescriptions and filling the prescriptions and making sure that I fit works and all these other things. So specialty can work to, a, to an extent. The second model is to understand that we got to stop talking about retailers and brands. Every retailer needs to be a brand. And so we see this with the white label movement of lots of retailers who are launching their own brands. You know, um, to just use the old school Sears and Kenmore uh, kind of example. But, you know, owning your own brands is really important these days because you need the margin and you got to know that your brands are competing with you. So if they're going to compete with you, you got to compete with them. So op uh, option two is become a brand. Option three is, and this third option I would say is only possible for the biggest, is become a marketplace. And so if you're targeting, if you're Walmart, if you're if you've got incredible scale and you say, you know what, I'm going to play the selection game. I'm OK without having proprietary product. I'm OK without having high degree of specialization. But then you got to have incredible scale of products, which basically means you got to become a marketplace and source from so many people and win the audience and be an alternative to Amazon and Alibaba. That's not for the faint of heart. We know that. But it right. can be done. You know, and some, and we've seen from the success of Walmart and Target, 
recently that, that that's possible. So I think those are the only three possible answers. And if you're not picking between those three, I think you're dead. The, the specialty concept, right? It reminds me a little bit of what you were talking about earlier uh, when you were talking about kind of a blurring of what is commerce, right? Commerce used to be this big box store. Now commerce is essentially every interaction. Do you see there being room in the marketplace for, uh, I don't even know how to describe this, like a blurring of publisher and retailer, a blurring of entertainer and retailer. A blur like, how does that work? I do, I think, I think the way it works is you get back to the seeker, you see what the seeker needs and you deliver it. And you don't ask, you don't say, hey, I'm a retailer, I'm a publisher, I'm a financial institution. I mean, we have, I'll give you another example. We've got a retailer who, um, you know, part of their, uh, part of the way, part of their business has a lot of returns because they're in fashion. So they thought about it as, well, originally we, most retailers will think about, re, uh, will think about returns as a cost. Like, oh my God, you know, I sold a bunch of shoes, but I'm going to get half of them back because people are going to try them on and not like them and send them back. And so they would think of how to minimize returns. Right. Um, and this retailer said, you know, actually, no returns are just, that's what they seek. They want to buy four pairs of shoes. Of course, Zappos had this model as well. We, we want to buy four pairs of shoes. That's a feature, not a bug. That's a part of what the consumer seeks. So let's just make that super easy. And in fact, what they did uh, in this case is they said, we're not going to charge you until after a certain period of time uh, and the returns are back. So otherwise, I'd have to pay for four pairs of shoes, return two and get a refund. But if I don't have to pay for all four and I can only pay for the one that I decide to keep, well, that's a better service for me as a consumer. But to pull that off, they kind of had to become a bank because they had to lend the money to, to the shopper to undertake that purchase before uh, they could, um, you know, they could complete the transaction. But they didn't say, well, that's a problem. We can't do that. They said, that's, that's, what, the, that's, what, the, that's what our customer seeks. So we're going to deliver it. And that's the mindset you got to have. That applies to publishing, entertainment, and whatever it takes. Makes sense. So just as we're thinking about this, and I'm speaking a little bit to the audience as well, um, this is a little bit uh, positive. It's an opportunity. There's also a little bit of, uh, it's a little bit scary. Because if you are in that business model that you spoke about a moment ago as going away, sort of the traditional retail model, you, you should probably make a decision pretty quickly, right? How, how, like if you were to add to your list of predictions, Will we start to see, or, or are we already seeing a crumbling of that model? And how much longer will that continue to work even on a, a smaller local scale? Yeah, I think, I think what we tend to see with these kinds of trends is that old habits actually take a really long time to die, but people die a slow death. So, you know, I think it's gonna take a while. I don't think we're gonna see like every retailer go under. I think we've seen an acceleration with the pandemic where people are starting to get this and get that they need to do something different. But I would say most people are at the step where they say, digital is really important, I'm gonna resource it accordingly. They're not at the step where they say, my entire business model or my business has to change in a digital context to win. Just moving from offline to online doesn't cause you to win in the long term. It causes you to get through the next year, two years, three years, five years, but it doesn't cause you to win. You got to take step two. You got to build for the seeker. You got to build on a new platform. You got to put your competitive advantage online. You have to treat it like a product. You got to build a digital team that wins. If you don't do those things, you'll still lose. You'll just lose digitally. Makes sense. Raj, I'm going to start to um, to go ahead and, and answer some of the questions that came in from the community. Uh, I'm going to actually, Steve, I'm going to start with uh, the comment you made about um, market research. And by the way, I'm going to invite you guys as I, as you answer these to the screen. So you'll appear here with, uh, with Raj and with me, if you wish to, you don't have to accept the invitation, but I'm gonna let you go ahead and answer or ask your question, um, uh, as you go. So, so Steve, I should have just invited you. Um, hopefully I did. And maybe you'll be able to join us if you wish to give him a second. Oh, he says now never, uh, let's see, that's a different one. 
So I'm gonna go ahead and read this and see if Steve does come on. But the question was, I work for a retailer and I know which one he does, so I know why this is a, a, an important question. One of the things they're looking for is recent market research showing the percentage of US shoppers that go online first to research before visiting a brick and mortar to purchase. I found some data, but looking for more, especially more recent. I'm gonna bet you maybe got an idea of, of, uh, of that, Raj. Would you mind answering that? Yeah, so you know, I think the research that, that I've seen actually suggests that you, you know, you've got to touch, the average customer that buys something has about 13 touch points, 12 to 13 touch points before they will actually buy something. Now, does that mean they're gonna walk into a store 12 or 13 times? Of course not, right? So actually, I think, you know, the answer to that is all. Like there, there's not a really a percentage because what is the other category? The other category is the true impulse purchase where I walk into a store and just decide to buy. Uh, and that is a very, very small minority of shoppers and purchases that occur online. So, yeah, what I haven't seen the specifics on, you know, on this question, but what I've seen is that when I put to triangulate the number of data points and the natural, um, you know, behavior of shoppers for most purchase categories needing multiple touch points, it's going to be all. So, Steve, I saw that you got on screen. Um, just by the way, Steve, this is obviously recording and in the community, you're going to be able to go back and see this specific question. So if you want to share that with anybody in the company, do you have any follow up there for Raj? Um, I don't know if you can hear me or not. I'm having some technical issue with the platform, um, but I see myself here now. So, yeah, thank you. Great information. And um, I did find some research um uh publicist sapient has a report it, yeah. it's a global report i was looking for just us uh and it said 87 percent uh, based on their market research in 2019 87 percent of uh shoppers again globally visit uh digital digital research first before visiting a brick and mortar for the purchase so that's the type of data I was looking for. Um, you know, I, I, I get that in theory it should be all, but uh, our demographic is uh, somewhat um, older and yeah. it's not always going to be all for us. And uh, by the way, I'm happy to report we're bucking the trend of uh, uh, brick and mortar model dying. It's we're, we're higher revenue than ever historically in 2020 and this year so far. So uh, if it's a slow death, it'll be a very slow death, I predict. <laughs> and so, uh, but I get how some retailers can struggle. It's going to depend on your model and your segment and so forth, your sector. Anyway, so yeah, I think there is real research out there, yeah, as opposed to just saying all. Uh, yeah. that, uh, that, And cool. that's what I'm looking for, some real market research. Because I did find some from 2013, 2016, obviously pretty old. So I somebody's probably doing some current research and I didn't know if you knew of anybody, so. Makes sense, and 87% sounds super reasonable, that makes sense. Yeah, there's always gonna be 10, 13%. And happy to see the business doing well. And, and just to be clear, I'm not bearish on brick and mortar at all. I think I think people are gonna have stores and stores are including, there's a question about, about digital in stores and, and I think that's gonna happen. So stores are gonna be a part of the mix. It's just what happens in the stores is gonna be different and what causes people to win in general digital and stores is going to look different. Did you, Raj, did yeah, you have I mean, a, I, a lot of what you said, I agree yeah. Sorry to interrupt. I was just going to say, do you, um, do you think there is, is it different for potentially older uh, consumers or maybe consumers that are in more rural areas than it would be, you know, generally? You know, what's interesting is uh, the, the biggest movers we saw in the pandemic in terms of new shoppers online were over the older demographic, right? Because historically that has accounted for the set of people who haven't visited stores uh, or sorry, haven't shopped online. But with the pandemic, there was no choice. And so I'm sure all of us have a story of somebody who learned how to use Zoom, how to use Instacart, how to order groceries online, how to order clothing online. And that story repeats itself in the data. Uh, and so what we see is that the fastest growth actually in the adoption of digital last year were the people who, you know, didn't historically shop online and that's typically older shoppers. Did that answer your question, Steve? Yeah, thank you. All right. 
So I'm going to go ahead and mark that done answering. And then, uh, by the way, if you go back and watch the, the replay, you'll be able to jump right to that. Carlos, you had a question that was specific to Bloomreach. I'm going to go ahead and invite you to the screen um, and then let you ask that question. This was the one you mentioned about uh, uh, e-commerce digital experience for a company that sells highly localized products. So, Carlos, you should be able to come on as you accept that. And chat with me if you're having issues accepting that, and I won't. Uh, I won't wait too long. Hey, Carlos, how you doing? Hey, everybody. Hey. Wonder Carlos, thank you for the great presentation. I really learned a lot, so I appreciate it a lot. For sure. For sure. Yeah. Uh, yeah so I just had a question. Um, uh, so our, our corporation does sell products that are like highly targeted to customers, like living in very specific United States locations. And you know all the products have like you know custom fields that are based on like city, zip code, and state. So you know um, we had a very successful year, and we're looking to uh, migrate to Shopify. But just speaking on, on on what you had talked about, Shopify and the digital experience, I was just curious if you could speak upon how how Bloom Reach could improve the yeah. e-commerce digital experience for a company that sells highly localized products and has a very large catalog of fifteen thousand products. So we don't sell a lot. Of any specific product, yeah. a lot to price, you know, the long tail. So just yeah. curious, you know, what your answer would be to that question. Yeah, and we've got lots of customers like that, I would say, that have a long tail of products and and really um, localized or customized in some way. And actually, I think the platform does very well for, for those kinds of cases in lots of ways. Number one, probably looking to drive more SEO traffic, figuring out how to put your products online so they're discoverable by people on Google and elsewhere to find the right product. It's hard to do that manually when you've got 15,000 products multiplied by the number of local, you know, customizations. And so the AI can figure that out and automatically largely create these pages that attract SEO traffic. There is a, it, it can help with the search technology uh, as well. So I'm sure findability is a problem if it's local, helping people find the right product once they get to your website. And so the search offering, you know, really helps people there. Um, you know, we see we, we, we see people want to not just have a templatized front end on top of Shopify, so it doesn't look like every other template. They want to be able to sort of customize it, edit it, uh, and make it look unique and unique to your brand. People, a lot of folks use our content capability in order to do that on top of Shopify as well. So lots of parts of the platform are there. And all of this, at the end of the day, is about revenue growth online. So if, if this all works, more people are converting because they're finding you, they're finding the right product, they're interacting with the right content. You're seeing your conversion rate go up, and that that's driving revenue for your business. Cool. And does uh, Bloomreach like directly integrate with um, uh, Shopify's interface? Um, so I guess just as a, from a developer point of view, I'm always concerned about maintenance and complexity yeah. of the systems. Yeah. Um, can you speak a little bit about upon that and the maintenance of Bloomreach on top of the Shopify platform? Yeah, so it's going to connect to the Shopify store and use the Shopify uh, storefront APIs. So it should be it. It, it's like it's like a lot of the other plugins that you get with Shopify. With Shopify. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thank you. So, Carlos, does that answer your question? Yes, that was great. All right. Well, thanks for for uh, coming on today. Appreciate it. Yes, sir. Thank you, Armando. Yep. So, um, the uh, a couple of questions actually came from Carrie, who is our uh, publisher. So, Carrie, maybe let me know in chat if you want to come on screen. I can invite you on or or not. I'll give you that choice. He said, sure. So here he comes. Uh, Carrie, that should be coming up there as well. And you can join us on screen. As we're waiting for Carrie, by the way, we uh, have been trying to test a lot of different platforms. So uh, as a member of the community, this is Crowdcast. Um, you had to do a separate registration for this, which we were concerned about. And so maybe also give me some feedback uh, in the community or or wherever you like about this platform. Hey, Kerry, how's it going? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Raj. Thanks for your time. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, Kerry, you had a couple questions in there. Why don't you go ahead? Yeah, Raj, I was curious on the dynamic that was uh, kind of following from your terrific presentation of the rise of digital and the dynamic of digital first merchants going to brick and mortar. You see more of that happening. I, I do. I do for sure. Yeah. Uh, you know, I think we're, we've seen that trend a little bit 
with with brands and digital companies setting up brick and mortar uh, locations. Obviously, Warby Parker is a great example of that, and others. I think, I, but I think they're going to be thought about really differently. So, you know, a, a retailer would think about the brick and mortar store as like this is where I sell. A digital brand will think about the physical location as part of their marketing, for the most part. Like no different than how they do customer acquisition online and brand marketing online. Well, maybe having a having a flagship store somewhere near Times Square or you know, in downtown San Francisco may make a difference in their brand and their brand presence. So they'll think of it that way, more likely, you know, as a place to drive their brand and their awareness than they will the place to go sell because they don't need the physical location to sell. Mm -hmm. yeah. And the, sec the second question was, uh, we've addressed cross border topics quite a bit here. Let me see. What's the future of cross border? Uh, mm. it seems like there's, there's almost like conflicting dynamics going on. One is the rise of digital. Also, it appears to be a rise of protectionist trade policies around the world. Yeah. Uh, so, what do you see happening there uh, going forward with cross border so Yeah, you know, I mean, I think what's interesting is that um, you're right. I mean, there are these kind of conflicting forces at work. It's really hard. I would say at the end for regulators to uh, obviate, you know, technology trends that have taken root at large scale among large numbers of people. The history of that is is very rare. Um, you know, it's the same reason why it's hard for the taxi companies to lobby against Uber. And it's you know, if, if they could switch the clock back, they might have said we should have done something about this 15 years ago. But the cat is out of the bag at this point, right? Uh, and the same is true with cross-border. I think there's so much cross-border commerce already. And, you know, you've got even people in places like China and who, who shop on U.S. websites and get those things shipped and all kinds of things of that type. So you can influence it, I think, with, with trade policy and the like, no doubt. But I don't think the macro trend around cross-border will get suppressed. Thank you. Well, those were uh, those were the questions that we had from the group. Um, Raj, thank you very much for uh, being with us today. I uh, sincerely appreciate it. It was a great presentation. And then to our community, just uh, thank you very much for attending. We're obviously going to have the recording um, available to uh, to everyone. And I would love to have your feedback, right? So not just for those of you who attended live, but also for everybody else in the community who may want to watch this. So please, after you exit here, Take a minute, go back to Commerce Co., uh, go to the event in Commerce Co., it's right under the events tab, and go ahead and leave some comments. If, uh, if I did a bad job, tell me. Uh, if you didn't like the platform, tell us, because the goal for Commerce Co. is to create a place where you can grow and engage, and uh, if we haven't done that, we want to improve. If we did do it, tell us we did right, so we can do more of it, okay? So that's your assignment uh, as a member of Commerce Co. Go back, give us some feedback, uh, and let the rest of the community know what you liked and didn't like about this. Raj, again, thank you. Uh, and, uh, and unless anyone else has any more comments, we're gonna go ahead and, uh, and end this broadcast. Everybody have a great day. Thank you. Thank you.